Hello, everybody, and welcome to the channel. Today, I'm joined by Danny from Draco Studios and Alessio Cavatori to talk about Battles of Valerna, a game coming from Draco set within the expansive Dragon Bond world. So, pleasure to have the pair of you with us today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks. So, um, before we get into the Battles of Valerna, um, Dragon Bond itself has been going for a little while now, Danny, um, and it, it covers a, a sort of a multitude of media as well. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about the the concept and the world that you, you're you developing there? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, well, Dragon Bond is a high fantasy universe. Uh, basically, the concept when we started, what we talked about is we want to do fantasy, the greatest fantasy that we can do. Uh, we want to rethink uh, like uh, throw all the basic concepts out the window change everything and make a full new fantasy world with all the things that we've always wanted to be in there mm -hmm. uh the biggest part of course is the, the namesake the, the dragon bond which is a, a unique event that links uh, a dragon and a, and a humanoid together and makes them like one force of change because th this universe is all about change uh everything that that becomes like stale and becomes uh like stuck somewhere it just needs to change and the forces of the world like the magic the vala which is what we call it uh just wants constant change and it uses uh its power to influence this kind of things so there's there's no destiny there aren't people born like to be heroes and uh, part of these changes if you want to create change and make change in the world the world will help you make this change so that's kind of our, our big concept uh on the world and uh, of course, we have a bunch of things. We have the the null, which is like the big bad. It's uh, this is like the counter of the energy of change. This is the energy of nothing. Mm -hmm. Like null wants silence, wants death. And uh, of course, within our world, there are tons of factions. Uh, we've been building like a whole universe. Uh, the realms are very different, very distinct. They have their own uh, politics, their own characters. Uh, we've like rethought uh, like all the fantasy races that you can think of. And it's all like interconnected through this big energy. So it's really a huge undertaking. It's like a, a whole new thing. Uh, we've been developing for now for, I think, four years. So there's a lot of work into it. Uh, like you said, we've been working on a, on a broad, uh, range of media. We have a comic book out already. We have novels in the work. We have a, a, a couple of RPG, uh, ventures already and we have more coming. And there, there, of course, is the, the war game, which is something that uh, both uh, me and Dan and the company who have been working on it from the start is something that we love. Like, we love all war games and we wanted to make our war game because we, we still believe that there isn't a fantastic fantasy war game out, out there. And we think we, we can do it. <laughs> I mean, we, we like to, to, to think that we can and we're taking the, the challenge to make it. Fantastic stuff. And the war game in question then is the battles of Valerna. Um, yes. So when we, we look at this, is it a massed battle, uh, a skirmish scale game? Does it scale in different sizes? What's the, the sort of the, the concept behind the actual tabletop game itself then? Um, so in, in concept, we like to think it's a very adaptable game. Uh, from the design and, and of course, <laughs> by the hand of uh, Alessio, mm -hmm. we've been uh, trying to make it a game that you can play at many scales and that, that you're able to like field massive battle, uh, battle forces and have like, have it out in a, in a huge table, like the classic style, what a war gamer wants, mm -hmm. but also have a nice, uh, smaller scale game at home in a smaller size table. Like just feel a, a couple units and maybe uh, a hero that leads them into battle, and then be able to have like uh, the different scales and uh, and I think I think it works uh, playtesting it and having uh, all this time because the the war game itself has been in development for about three years as well, <laughs> so it's it's been through many stages. Uh, right now, uh, I think it's uh, in a really refined stage, but uh, I'll let I'll, I'll let you take over. <laughs> Tell us what he thinks. <laughs> Yes, it has been quite a long time, hasn't it? Yes, we. I remember we from the very beginning when. Uh, I mean, let's let's be clear as well. I don't want to steal your your idea. Some of the USP, some of the unique things in this game, 
which we worked on together for years, developing them, refining them, and you now making them better, are your ideas, not my ideas. I wouldn't want people to think <laughs> I'm stealing everything. It was me all the time. Now, basically, I, I was uh, brought into the project uh, very early on, and uh, for about three years, it's been three years. Wow. <laughs> We'd be play testing, refining, doing a new version, play testing it, refining, doing a new version, as you do with, with our games. <laughs> uh, you know, it, the job is never finished. You keep going, oh, uh, we'll play test for another six months. Oh, right. And we make a new version and then play test for another six months <laughs> and so on and so forth. Um, if, um, I mean, speaking of the scale, uh, your question, uh, I, I think we we started play testing at a medium scale and then we pushed the boundaries in both directions. And I have to say, just recently, we designed some scenarios, introductory scenarios for the campaign and everything which work uh, on a smaller scale. And I was a bit nervous. I was like, oh, will it, will it work? And actually, I enjoy, I love those, those small scenarios because the feeling is we're having very few units like that. Everything becomes really, really important. As in yeah. All the things that, because you used to play it on a bigger scale where you kind of go, well, this unit is expendable. I'll throw them there just, you know, to lure the enemy in and then hit them. And I've now you don't have... speed bumps in my life here with these people on the team. <laughs> and yeah. now I have I have two units and they're here. I kind of go, mm, yeah, no, the all... Nobody's expendable. For so, sure. So when... Taking a look at some of these figures then, when you're playing in that smaller scale, obviously the the with the name Dragon Bond, you're thinking the, the big heroic character bound to a dragon or vice versa or you know symbiotic if you want both working together <laughs> do they take a back seat then when you're playing the smaller games and, and you focus more on the um individual infantry and, and heroes and cavalry like that or is there still the potential to to put some of these big expansive characters and, and monsters onto the table in the smaller games well, I mean, obviously, there's many different scenarios, and the the answer to your question varies depending on the scenario you're playing. But in general, you would be able to field a dragon with a dragon rider on. However, that will be your army. So if suddenly the scenario is about controlling several objectives, several parts of the table, you're going to go, ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So you you can dismount and you send your dragon that way. You'll take that objective. I'll take this one. But then you see the issue. If there's yeah. more than a certain number of objectives, uh, I mean the dragon bomb, the thing you mentioned in game mechanics terms, and uh, Danny mentioned in terms of background, I think is one of those uh, unique mechanics here and uh, very defining of the game. Mm -hmm. When you when and I you know very interesting I think uh when I just explain to people is that you're if you have a dragon rider so one of the great heroes of Valerna uh, and the dragon there the, on the scene the same army uh, you can choose at the beginning whether the two are bonded or not. Mm -hmm. I that if the army represents a stage of their life of the of the story where they hadn't bonded yet you know, they, they started, or before, so before or after. Um, and it's a crucial choice and determines how the game will go very much for you from now on. The The point is, if, the, if you decide they're bonded, both the dragon and the hero become more powerful, considerably more powerful. Everything they do is upgraded. They become really scary, really, really scary, difficult to take down, very powerful when they attack. So it's, it's, you know something that you go well for sure i mean why wouldn't i <laughs> go for that yeah. and the reason why you wouldn't is that unfortunately then if one of them is killed they both die okay <laughs> so it's all, all the eggs in one big dragon basket absolutely well then they, if they don't need to be mounted you could have a bonded pair and still divide them and send mm -hmm. them in different places their energies remain graded mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a life thing it's for life oh, like a life link between them yeah. right yeah. Absolutely. but that's obviously like you were saying if you put all in one basket so they can be safer because they're together so this becomes like a the nuke in the dragon bond mm -hmm. equivalent you know great hero bonded dragon and there's not very much that can stand against that uh but of course, then, yes, all your eggs are in one basket, all your points, all your, a lot of points are in one place. And as mm -hmm. you know, in war games, obviously, concentration of points is good for the, you know, being strong in one point. But then, depending on the scenario, you may want to spread your 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 force. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if they are bonded and separated, or even together, I mean, it's a huge risk and a huge advantage. So you're kind of going, hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> which one? So that's a... That's a very cool uh, mechanic. Uh, what um, 
what what's the core basis then is it card driven or dice driven and um and, and if so sort of how do those factors play into the, the mechanics of the game then yeah so it's definitely uh dice dice driven uh it's based on a d10 system mm -hmm. however the dice we use are not like uh numbered d10s they don't have like numbers ranging from one to, to ten it's just uh we use the, the d10 as a base and then we have different tiers of, of dice mm -hmm. so each dice has different uh hits uh we have hits double hits critical hits all in one die and then there are levels like the uh, low level medium medium tier and high tier dice so, and uh, then each unit has a card, which is very clear to read, like what what his attack and his defense are. Defense are D6 dice. But this is a, a really simple system that like basically takes numbers out of the equation. Like you basically just roll the dice and immediately you know what you how many hits you did, how many critical hits. And uh, and of course, this is in part uh, because the concept that we're pushing is making it a game that it's easy to learn, uh, easy to teach to people that takes away some of this uh, number crunching, which mm. I mean, I, I love, I still love like classic war games, but this is, we're kind of trying to bridge the gap a bit with board gamers and with reaching a wider community, like telling people, hey, you don't need to be scared of war games. <laughs> They're fun. Uh, just join the fun, come with us, <laughs> basically. It's, it's not all books like Role Master with table upon table. <laughs> yeah. <So I> <laughs> And uh, so all the components are thought to be uh, things that you have in front of you that will make you uh, ma make it playing the game easier. And uh, it's fun because we've been developing developing this for years, and uh, we see like now the industry like take like this direction, like War Warhammer is now doing this, and other big companies are doing this. So it's fun that that we kind of got the right got it right. I think because once you see everybody starting to do this kind of thing, like. Every unit will have its card, so that way you have it in front of you. No longer do you have to like go through the whole book looking for the stats for your unit sure. and uh, trying to look for rules and stuff. Um, so yeah, and uh, the dice are a really big thing. Uh, I, I'm really fond of our, our dice system. I think it, it makes the game really playable. Like I play tested with people who have never played a war game before. And, and as soon as you give them the dice, it's like, just roll the dice that it says on the card, and you'll know instantly what happens, no matter if it's your first time playing or you've been playing for a while. Did that make life easier then when it came to developing the lists? Because you currently have five factions um, for it. And, and with having sort of tiered set of dice, uh, when it comes to differentiating between a an infantry or cavalry from one faction or another, then you can sort of be a bit more flexible. You're not you're not restricted to a single dice type and a stat. You can go well, X number of tier one and and one tier three or whatever sort of combination is is in there. Is that the sort of way it, it played out? Yes, I think in terms of uh, <clears throat> reflecting what you're saying, uh, imagine where you have a system where there's three levels and we call them white, gray, and black because. Mm -hmm from the lowest to the strongest. That's the core of the dice. <laughs> Simple. Um, um, the, uh, um, in terms of attack, for example, uh, when you're creating something for attack, uh, what I'm thinking when I write up a stat line, when I bounce a model, is uh, white dice would, in my head, represent somebody with a short sword or maybe two shots or two white dice, so a mm -hmm. death by a thousand cats kind of thing. So Because those dice don't have critical hits in so they they only have hits potentially they could have a lot of hits but they don't go through enemy armor critical hits go through armor automatically so the idea is a lot of, that you count on the number of hits rather than the power of the hits but actually when you are at the opposite end of the scale and you think something that maybe has a huge mole you know something a big thing that hits really hard maybe once you go right that's one black dice yeah which actually has the chance of doing a lot of damage and and the chance uh, of doing criticals uh, the, the criticals start with a gray dice but are far more likely on a gray die or the black die so and then you assign in my head it was like number of attacks is number of dice and power of attack is the color of the dice mm -hmm. so it, that's the, the roughly the criteria that okay. we, we used interesting stuff uh, but the the melee isn't the only part and parcel then of the uh of the game because there's also a magical side with valor uh, that you've mentioned already, Danny. Is that is it 
play a big role? Because I know sometimes you get a fantasy game where magic will be the frosting on the cake. It'll be very thin. It's 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 just there layered over the top. And then in some games you can get where it's so integral um, that almost it would be detrimental not to bring magic with you on the tabletop. Uh, where does where does Battles of Valerna sort of sit on that? Um, I, I think it's a uh, it's a big part of uh, of the game. Maybe not in a in a such a direct way. Like right now, some units are just magic by nature. Mm-hmm. So even though their attacks deal the same kind of dice and everything, they're actually using magic to, to do those those attacks. Uh, but where magic comes directly into play is uh, your heroes. Uh, like, yeah, uh, that's Aela. That's uh, one of the characters from our comic book. Uh, he's a uh, he's a an uh, an uh, an elf that spent all his life among the dream elf, which is a different, a different ancestry that we have, and uh, the dream magic that they that they can bring upon uh, using five, which is one of the parts of the Vala. Uh, he can enact them, and and a really neat way that that Alessio did for magic is, you can like take some spells that are from from any discipline, and then uh, you buy those kind of uh, as you're building your army, you can buy spells. And these have like general effects. Uh, most of them are one use. So you bring them and you have them on your hand and you can basically use them. But then some of the characters have some unique spell. And, and this, this is where it becomes a bit fun. because you, you can then feel the hero because it potentially has access to a spell that you really want. Uh, so it, it really comes down to the heroes. Like in, in the units, you'll see magic through their regular attacks. Like if you have a, a unit of Dreamcasters, which is a, a, a Larian unit, They'll be just casting magic all the game, and it'll be mostly to attack. But then you can have some extra effects in your hand, and then you can use those whenever you need them. Some of them are like general effects, like uh, your attacks get upgraded for the rest of the turn, so that in, uh, that is like magic, like filling uh, some of your units. Or it can be something a bit more extreme. Some of them are attacks, uh, so you can like randomly like drop a, drop a new attack. And uh, since you buy them, you're potentially allowed to like have a bunch of spells in hand ready to cast and then have some unique spells. So that like makes you think of which characters you want to field. Do you want to field the characters that have access to some spells or others? And then do you want to have buy those with points? So I think in, in that way, uh, we're really like showing the the var- variety of how magic works in, in, in this world. Interesting stuff. Yes. Um, Sorry, if I may add, on, no, uh, it's interesting how every faction uh, so basically, like Ladani would say, we have a generic set of spells of uh, Vala cards mm-hmm. that um, can uh, be taken by any faction. But then there's specific ones to the faction as well, which are very characterful. They're steeped in the lore of that faction. So uh, I don't know, Tiberian magic is all blooded and about death and explosions of blood and so it's all like that while nawak magic is more to do cab magic is to do with nature terrain manipulation of terrain and mists and winds and you know kind of uh, while the while the alarian magic is misdirection dream illusion uh the transportation teleportation so there's more far more subtle um and so it's fun to adapt the spells to that kind of um of to, to the lore is always the the thing if 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 the if the rules reflect the lore then you feel like you're doing a good job and it's like yep that's the flavor you want so with the um some of the images we're seeing here with the i suppose massive creatures and monsters are these tied to specific factions or uh are they more a a sort of a a neutral wandering monster threat the the sort of thing that Mm -hmm. may appear in any army or they're they're are they pulled in for specific factions because of where they come from or how they uh, approach sort of life? Yeah, so th- those are yeah not tied to any any faction per se. They they come from different realms. For example, mm-hmm. this is an Igarua who is like a massive, almost mountain made of ice. It's huge. It's a uh, big in dimensions and it's a uh, very scary. It's not an evil monster based per se, but it's a force of nature. So if you get in, the, in its way, it'll wreck you. And uh, this one comes from the Isval territories, because those are in the north, those are in the like frozen tundra and stuff. So they're kind of tied conceptually to a to a place and the and the realm. But since it's a war game, like they could there could be a, a skirmish or a fight in in that in those lands by two different realms who are not Isval. 
and this the spiritual could appear. And one of the the latest things that that Alessio has been developing, which I, I find really fun because it adds a a lot of fun to the to the game, is uh like adding <laughs> wandering monsters and and things that are that are neutral. Like you're not fielding this creature as as any of the of the opponents, and you're just agreeing to have maybe less of a of a match play and like competitive aspect and more of a fun a fun mm-hmm. fantasy scenario where maybe you were hashing out a battle suddenly a large creature appears and you have to say hey so do we keep fighting or do we fight this thing together or do i wait for it to kill you or a lot of things there's nothing worse than getting two sides together after decades of fighting for a peace treaty and all of a sudden a wandering ice monster comes out of nowhere and starts attacking everybody. It's very <laughs> difficult to explain to the faction leader that you didn't actually destroy their faction. They don't even listen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are some very different ways these things work and it was very very fun to develop it because <laughs> imagine some of them have indeed are completely neutral, have a effectively an AI deck so they yeah. would randomly do things it's like you know attack the closest unit uh, attack the closest wounded unit uh, it has and it varies some of them are more uh, more straightforward big beastie that just wants to eat anything some of them are more complicated uh, like we have uh, i think the the storm worm this giant sandworm that disappears into the ground and then pops up when units move so you're kind of suddenly going ah <laughs> do we continue our battle <laughs> do we continue exactly what we don't read or do we continue our battle or well if i continue the battle and i'm moving then uh, there's something <laughs> so they create scenarios on their own yeah. with uh, with uh, with those cards but some other ones are more sophisticated like demon lords where actually uh th- they basically every turn you hire them you bid for their services so they you bid with victory points but you can also some of them you can be bribed with blood lives so okay. so you yeah. kind of bribe for control of the of the giant creature that doesn't really care it just goes with the highest bidder so every turn this thing will go to the highest bidder and therefore you know turn around and <laughs> to do things so again this is a, this bidding mechanic every turn where you go maybe i'll let him have it this turn because it's so far away maybe he cannot go and then i'll save my bid for the moment when i really so it, there is a, a lot of that and some of them are just plain mercenaries that any army can just hire and add to their force. So there's a mix. There's several mixed ways of how they work. Yeah, I, really, I love that bidding mechanic. The idea that, fun. that maybe you sacrifice a unit or a, a chunk of victory points because you know the the long term game gains will be worth far more than that that slight negative dip at the the start of things. Or alternatively, you you might think that your opponent is really keen on bidding for it and you push a lot of whatever, whether it's <laughs> people into the maw or victory points uh, to the side, uh, and then your opponent didn't really care at all. <laughs> if, if you're bidding off against each other, presumably whatever you bid is lost regardless of whether you win or not. It depends on the on the creature. I mean, oh, it, is, okay. it depends. The background, obviously, in some cases, you will literally be killing people mm. and offering souls. In some okay, cases, maybe just, just an offer. Of my opponent just so, butchering so, a unit and just going, oh, I didn't want it anyway, man. So <laughs> it, it, it does vary. It does yeah. vary. I mean, I was thinking of history, you know, like those battles in ancient, I don't know, Japan or mm. Renaissance Italy, where you have, you know, the general turns up and there's a force on the hill there and it goes, I wonder whether they're on our side or, <laughs> or not. The <laughs> sort know? of question you do need to answer yeah. early. Isn't uh, it? You know, and you're engaging, yeah. you're like, are you going to charge them now? With this? Oh, no, they're charging us on the side. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I told you to offer them. It's like, oh, but yeah. <laughs> so that kind of feeling of, hmm, on which side are these guys? <laughs> you know, sounds fantastic. Um, so moving away from the, the gameplay itself then, the upcoming campaign, uh, the plan behind uh, Dragon Bond is to be entirely print and play. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about the concept behind this? Um, yeah, so my background personally is a lot into 3D printing. Like as soon as it started becoming feasible to to have a thing that could make sculpts into a reality and you have physical models, like uh, I, I'm a digital sculptor as well, so that as soon as it became a reality, it really came into my mind as, as the next big thing. Um, so w- whatever we're doing, it doesn't matter if it's uh, board games, uh, even for the for some of the comic campaigns, we do some models and we give them away, uh, the war game, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. The idea is that we want to put it in the hands of people faster. I mean, we, we are also aiming for a physical release, like it's also there. Okay. 
but of course of course physical release comes with a big investment uh tooling and yeah. getting everything ready marketing so but but we do have, we do did make this in mind with making it a physical product but uh once we had like uh, part of the development done we we're like wh why not get it in the hands of people earlier like mm -hmm. and uh we we don't think one necessarily cancels the other out like i for example i have tons of plastic models and i have tons of 3d printed models and uh, everybody who collects things knows that you just want more and, and some of them i I'm, I'm really special about like this one i want specifically in plastic and this one i want specifically 3d printed because they allow you to do different things so right now we're doing and and we already have i think the the campaign we're doing has over 250 models all in all so it's a it's really a, a lot of things uh we're mm -hmm. revamping some of our, our models we're adding scenic data to everything like we really want to want, want this to loop when, once you feel it on the table like this is a product like if i saw this on a shelf i would buy it as well but i have the capability to print it at home and uh maybe if you want to print a hundred of the same unit go ahead <laughs> like uh you, you collect and you print whatever you want so we've always been very very much pro 3d printing and uh and i think we have built a great 3d printing community uh, as a company but we're also very much behind the idea of this is going to be a physical launch because that inevitably reach, reaches more hands. Mm. If, if uh, I think I saw a stat the other day, uh, one in 10 ha houses in the, in the US, for example, has a 3D printer. And uh, that's good. Like that means there's a wide audience for it. Yeah. But there's nothing like having it in your local gaming store and uh, just running into it. Like I ran into Warhammer when I was 12 and, uh, and sunk a lot of my money there. But um that feeling of just entering your local hobby store uh and seeing like a box of something and being like i don't even know what that is but now i want to know because i saw it so we want to be there too like the one one isn't more important than, than the other like we want both <laughs> and actually and technology and, and actually people can already uh, get a, a kind of a preview of the of the plastic models by buying the the board game Lord, Lords of yeah. Valor, the board game Lords of Valor, which Played we it? also mm. we also we also worked on, has models that are compatible with Battles of Valerna. So you can categorize like plastic models that I can also <laughs> use for the board game and the war game. Yeah. Well, I was going to say because there's um, you have a tribes, um, I don't know what they call them, tribe subscription. Is that is yeah. that the term? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not up to date with the kids. Um, so people can get some of the the earlier. Uh, iterations of a lot of these things already and the current rules which are up to the fifth edition unless yeah. he said in a high questioning voice <laughs> um, they're available on the Draco Studios Five. website so people could um, actually start playtesting and trying some of these things out in advance if they if they fancy giving it a go as well <laughs> um, yes. yes and and actually uh, after after this campaign which is uh, launching soon uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna revamp our tribes. Like uh, we're making it focused solely on on the war game. Like every release starting July and after that, we'll build uh, on the war game with uh, with the other great concept. Because uh, there's basically two completely new things for this campaign, which are in the new rules that that you mentioned. Those are already up. Okay. But there's uh, the wandering monsters, which Alessio already spoke a bit about, and then we have mercenary units, which are uh, units that are part of realms. So you could go to Alaria, Tiberia, uh, Triumvirate, like the different armies we have. Uh, and uh, there are some units that are available to all the armies. So you can potentially like fill that full Alarian army. But hey, I like the the raptors, uh, the, ra the orc riding raptors from the Obakar army. So mm -hmm. let's get let's get a couple of those in. And that that of, of course adds uh, some pretty cool thing because uh, now you're able to like. Our, uh, like army listing and list building becomes really fun because you have access to different pieces of different realms and they of course come with some unique rules some unique things they won't be compatible for example with some of your captains and uh, your heroes and generals because uh, they're not part of the same army which much as a mercenary unit in the real world would be like yeah these guys are working for you but they might not necessarily like mesh very well with your orders and how you how you tell them to do things uh, so that's pretty fun. And uh, the mercenaries are, in, in my head at least, a big way to expand on the game. It lets us show sneak peeks of, of different uh, uh, new armies or new realms 
without having to do this big releases like here's a huge army of 70 models because that's like a huge undertaking sure. this way we're going to be like hey here's a sneak peek of what's to come and you can feel this no matter what army you play so terrific idea is there any one particular thing then that you're looking forward to seeing from the campaign and seeing people get their hands on is there is there a standout model or uh range within there that you just think i can't wait until people see this and see what i can do on the tabletop mm, i mean i personally really really like the the sabar triumvirate army because i mean oryx riding dinosaurs we have like amber fire uh jan who are like uh basically our our, our take on the of the gen the the the, the unit the like magic unit and uh, and they also have like this snake people so they're like this mix of monstrous races and they're all like pretty cool and and i don't know there's something about orcs riding dinosaurs which <laughs> just gets to me i think everybody loves that <laughs> yeah if, you, if you're not a fan of orcs riding dinosaurs it's probably time to check your pulse uh, yeah. there we have it folks uh dragon bond battles of valerna uh it'll be coming to kickstarter soon i'm not sure when this video is going out so we can't say exactly how soon um <laughs> but keep your eye out for it we'll definitely be revisiting it during the campaign as well if you have any questions please drop them below and if you want to find out more i will put the links to uh draco studios the rules and everything else in the little doobly doo below but until next time thank you very much Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.